Uh, Sadi, my name is Russell Keith McGee. Uh, I'd like to thank Dylan and Francois and the entire Pakon Thailand team uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I come from Wajuk Nungabuja, uh, otherwise known as Perth, Western Australia, uh, the little red pin ever so slightly to the south of where we are right now. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to pieces of the Python community all over the world, but no matter where it is, it's an absolute honour to be able to add another pin to my map. But who am I anyway? Well, in my day job, uh, I am a senior data engineer at Savata. Savata is a brand intelligence platform. Uh, we use Python and data science to deliver accurate consumer insights and predictive analytics, ensuring that brand marketing has the highest possible impact. Uh, they give me the flexibility to attend conferences like this one, for which I'm very thankful. I became involved in and I'm known to the Python community through my work on Django. Uh, I joined the Django core team way back in 2006. Django is a big part of the broader Python ecosystem, but it is not the only part. Django isn't the only Python web framework, and web programming isn't the only thing people do with Python. In my current day job at Savada, I don't use Django at all, but I do make extensive use of NumPy and Jupyter and Pandas and the ecosystem of tools around those libraries. And there are many other uses of Python. You can use Python on embedded devices. There are libraries for performing astronomical calculations, for biotech, for gene sequencing. It's used as a scripting language for operating system automation, as a control language for DevOps, as a teaching language. Now, as you may be able to guess, from my many years of involvement in the Python ecosystem, I like Python. I'm not going to claim Python is perfect, but I am very happy living my life as a Pythonista. And because of that, I want to be able to run Python on all my devices, not just my laptop and my server, but my phone, my tablet, my watch, my set-top box, and not just some token idea of running Python either. I want to deliver a full developer experience, not in some sort of sandbox, but a fully-fledged first-class citizen developer experience for each of these platforms. But that's not really currently possible. This capability gap is one of the reasons that I changed the focus of my open source contributions a couple of years ago. These days, I spend most of my time not on Django, uh, but on the Beware project. For those who haven't come across it before, Beware is an open source collection of tools and libraries for creating native user interfaces in Python. Uh, for desktop, but also for iOS, for Android, for single page web apps, and other new hardware platforms. Now, if you're here today at PyCon Thailand, you're probably somewhat like me, at least, in liking Python, so I don't have to convince you of the benefits of Python as a language. What I might need to convince you of is that it is, uh, it is, it is desirable and maybe even plausible to run Python on these non-traditional devices, and assuming that it is possible, that it's worth the effort to try. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, the how and the why of running Python everywhere. Okay, so first off, let's deal with the how. There's no point getting all philosophical about why you should do something if you can't actually do it. So let's play a little game. You have just had some fancy new hardware device dropped into your lap. What options do you have for getting Python to run on it? Well, to answer that question, we actually have to start a little bit higher up with a slightly different question. We need to start with what. What is Python? Well, it's a programming language, right? Well, except that it isn't. Depending upon who's talking, Python could be one of two things. Python, the language, is an abstract thing. It's a specification of syntax and semantics that describes how a particular sequence of human readable bytes will be interpreted by a computer to do something interesting. But then there's the Python that's the interpreter that you install and run. When you tell someone, go to the Python website and download Python, you're not strictly talking about Python, the language. You're talking about CPython which is the de facto reference implementation of the Python language spec. This separation between implementation and specification is valuable because it means that CPython isn't the only way that Python can be interpreted. There are lots of benefits or lots of, lots of features of Python as experienced by end users that are features or misfeatures of CPython, not of Python itself. Take the gill, the global interpreter lock, the perpetual bane of every Python performance discussion is not an inherent feature of Python. It is a feature, or misfeature, of the CPython implementation of Python, a specific reference implementation of the Python language spec. CPython, because of the way it's implemented, has a gill. Other implementations of the Python language specification, like Jython, PyPy, Stackless, do not have a gill. 
This separation means that when we're talking about getting Python running on a fancy new hardware device, there are a couple of different approaches that are possible depending upon the capabilities of the device that you are targeting. Now, the, the easiest approach, of course, is to just use CPython. When you start a Python shell, or you run a Python script on your laptop or on your server, chances are this is what you are actually doing. You are running the reference implementation of the Python language standard. It's called CPython because it is, not surprisingly, written in C. And one of the side effects of being written in C is that it makes it really easy to port to new platforms. In this regard, it's following the tradition that was laid down by Unix. One of the major reasons for the proliferation of Unix as an operating system in the, is that in the early days of computers, dozens of manufacturers were making machines, IBM, DEC, Univac, hundreds of others. And technology was advancing so quickly that there would be a major shifts in hardware architecture between versions of the device. And so each device would come from the factory with its own eclectic operating system. In the late 1960s, Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Brian Kernighan, and a bunch of other people working at Bell Labs worked something out. If you could define a minimal kernel that could be ported to any machine that provided a common API for operations like memory management and process invocation and I.O., then you could use that kernel to bootstrap the rest of an operating system. And they then developed a programming language, C, to make this even easier. The original versions of C were developed to make it easy to port Unix to new hardware platforms. The kernel was written in assembly language for a specific machine and architecture, and that got smaller and smaller over time, and the operating parts of the operating system, the parts that were written in C, could be easy to for any new kernel that was implemented. And that's essentially what CPython looks like when you want to port it, just at a slightly higher level of abstraction. As long as you've got a C compiler, you can compile the CPython core, giving you a Python interpreter that you can run. And that's a threshold that most modern computing devices can support. One of the first pieces of software ported to any new hardware platform is almost always a C compiler. And once that exists, anything written in C can be ported to that platform. That means you can compile CPython and you then get the rest of the Python standard library and the rest of the Python ecosystem essentially for free. But even this compilation process can give you some options. If you're using a compiled language like C, the usual approach is to write some code uh, and use a compiler on the same machine that you intend to run that code. Now, if you're on a desktop or a server machine, that makes perfect sense and it works really well because you have a C compiler because you had to have one to port Unix. But on some devices, it isn't plausible, either because a compiler hasn't been ported to that platform or because compilation on the device isn't actually plausible. Consider, for instance, do you want to run a compiler on your watch? Compilation is a CPU-intensive process. Do you really want your watch turning into a molten ball of metal while it's attached to your wrist? I didn't think so. So you really only need to have a way to compile somewhere else and then get the compiled product onto your watch. And that's what cross-compilation is. A compiler, at the end of the day, is just a magic box that takes human-readable input and makes machine-readable output. There's nothing that says that the machine-readable output has to be read by the same machine that is doing the compilation. At the end of the day, it's just bytes. OK, yes, it is a little bit more difficult to set up, and there are plenty of opportunities for things to go very badly wrong, but those are resolvable problems. And Python has this ability built into its build system. It's something you get almost for free when you use the GNU autoconf toolchain, which is what Python uses to manage its build system. I'd say you almost get it for free because GNU autoconf is a very special snowflake, but at least in principle, the GNU toolchain for C compilers has been designed to support platform cross-compilation. This is the reason that C compilers exist. OK, so we've now got a C compiler that runs on our hardware device, or we have a C compiler that can target that new device. So we're set. We can compile the stock C Python sources and get the same C Python that you get on a server. That doesn't mean you have the same C Python experience, though. If you're running, for example, on a watch, you can't just open up a shell prompt and start typing in commands like you would on your laptop. So you have a problem. How do you interact with Python when you don't have a keyboard with a standard input and a standard output? Are you stuck? Well, the good news is no, you're not. C Python is written in C, and while it certainly can be invoked from a command line and provide a prompt, it doesn't actually require that. The command line experience is essentially just a wrapper around a very specific selection of setup and tool a teardown tooling. The code for the Python executable itself, the part that you, the thing that you see when you run Python at the command line, 
That code is actually remarkably simple. It's really just a pipeline for getting keyboard input um, or file input and passing it to the real engine, an embedded library that is called, not surprisingly, libpython. That library is what actually implements the run this Python code part of the puzzle. So as long as you can build a library, uh, build a binary, any binary that initializes and invokes some key methods in libpython, you can have Python code running on any device you want. And then it's up to the device to determine uh, how you get your Python script and how you pipe that Python script into the Python interpreter that is running. Do you want to provide a prompt? Fine, work out how to display a prompt on the device, read that input, pass the content to libpython. Do you want to read the code from a file? Fine, read the code from a file, pass that content into libpython. Once you've got that running interpreter, you're then probably going to want to access system native libraries so that you can actually do something interesting with the capabilities of the device you're on. Now, if you've got this far, it's because you've got a C compiler, and that generally means you've got a C library under the hood providing those services. Uh, that means you can use one of the features that's built into the Python standard library, C types, to access those services. C types is a library that exploits the fact that at the assembly language level, right down when the code is executing, the way you invoke a function, what's called the calling convention, uh, that the calling convention that is used by C compilers is well defined. Uh, since it's well defined, it means you don't actually have to use a C compiler to generate code that will be interpreted by the CPU at runtime as a function call. Any tool that can generate a compatible sequence of assembly language commands can invoke any function on any library, regardless of what library is doing the calling or what language the library was originally written in. So using C types, what you can do, you, all you have to do is describe the prototype of the C method, you know, what arguments it takes, what values it returns, and you can then invoke that method directly from Python without the need to compile anything. And if you want, you can abstract those C type level calls into a nicer, more Pythonic API, and you end up with a Pythonic interface to native system services. When this approach works, it's actually not that hard to get going. It's the approach that makes Python available on pretty much every desktop and laptop that's ever been made, or every server that's been made. It's also the approach that I've been able to use to get Python working on iPhones and iPads and Apple TV set-top boxes and, in principle, Apple Watches, but I haven't actually sat down and played with a physical Apple Watch. Although Apple hides a lot of the details behind Xcode and their whole ecosystem of build tools, uh, the core of what you're doing on all of those devices is plain old Unix and C. They do cover it up with a lot of layers, but at the, at the core, at the metal, it is Unix and C. And because it's Unix and C, uh, you can compile C Python for iOS, for tvOS, for watchOS, get a libpython that works, and then uh, wrap those native interfaces with C types. And then what Beware does is provide a library called Rubicon, those objective C native Apple services as Pythonic classes, you never actually know that you're calling Objective-C, you're just calling Python classes that look and feel like Python classes. But what about when this doesn't work? What happens when you don't have a C compiler or when C isn't your native system language? Like, for example, on Android or in the web. If you read the advertising copy for Android, it sells itself as a Linux and then promotes Java as its user space programming language. The catch is Android isn't really either of those things. Um, it's, yes, it is Linux at some level, but it's not Linux at any level that is actually interesting from the perspective of developers. The kernel is written in C, uh, and the C compiler can target that kernel, but the C layer only has access to bare level system services. So you can't do anything interesting from the Android as a portable computing device perspective. All of Android's user space libraries are exposed using Java APIs. Now, Android provides NDK, which is the native developer kit, and Java as a language has something called JNI, the Java native interface, which is effectively C types for Java. Uh, so it is possible to do Python on Android using this approach, but it's not the only approach that's possible. There are also platforms where it just isn't practical to use CPython. MicroPython is a good example of this. CPython is a great implementation of Python as a language specification. But embedded devices have extreme constraints of memory and CPU power by comparison to servers and laptops. And so CPython as an implementation is just too big to fit on most embedded microcontrollers. So you have to look at other ways of providing an implementation of Python if you want to use Python on those devices. And what about the web? You know, how do you compile C code for the web? So if you've got one of these platforms where C Python isn't an option and you want to use Python on it, you effectively need to provide a new implementation of Python. 
uh, one that is native to the capabilities of the platform that you are running. But you don't necessarily have to implement all of CPython. What do I mean by that? Well, if you pull apart a Python implementation, there are actually a whole bunch of pieces. The full stack consists of a parser, which takes human input and turns it into an in-memory representation of code. There's a compiler, which takes that in-memory representation and turns it into something that can be executed. In CPython, that's bytecode. There's then an eval loop, which can read and run the output of the compiler. That's what you experience as the Python executable. And then there's the standard library, which is used by the code running through the eval loop. The simple approach, of course, is to just re-implement the whole lot. Now, rewrite the whole thing in Java or C Sharp or whatever other language or runtime you've got. Those parts of the standard library that are written in Python, you don't need to re-implement. You can just use them as is, but the rest you port over. And that's what uh, MicroPython and Jython and IronPython and Sculpt and Brython and many other uh, implementations of Python do. They are wholesale re-implementations of all of CPython, except for the bits of the standard library that are written in Python and therefore can mostly be used as is. But that's not the only approach you can take. You don't have to throw out the entire CPython stack and start from scratch. CPython provides, not surprisingly, a really good parser for Python code that outputs a data structure that is a parsed, ready to manipulate version of that code as entered by a human. That data structure is called the AST, or the Abstract Syntax Tree. It's a representation that has been designed to be manipulated and transformed and converted. The normal CPython compiler takes that AST and converts it into bytecode that can then be executed by CPython's event loop. However, you can just as easily take that AST and convert it into any other representation that might be useful. For example, Java bytecode or .NET CLR bytecode. And that approach is what Voc does. Voc is a Beware project that is effectively a cross-compiler for Python code. It's a compiler that is written in Python, so it can be executed by CPython, but the output of that compiler is Java bytecode. And that Java bytecode can then run on any JVM instance. When the Java bytecode runs, it is indistinguishable from code that came from Java source files, but it references line numbers from Python source files. So we can reuse CPython's parser. But do we have to stop there? Is there any more of CPython that we can reuse in our quest to get Python running on, our plat on a different platform? Well, yeah, if you want to, you can reuse CPython's compiler too. If you want to run some Python code in a .py file through a CPython compiler, you add it outputs a .pyc file. The .pyc file is the compiled version of the code. It's a binary representation, not a system binary, but it's, so it's not executable by itself. It's what's called a bytecode representation. Bytecode is a bit like high-level assembly language. It's specific to Python, but it's an encoded set of instructions for a stack-based virtual machine. There's basic primitives like pushing values onto a stack, popping values off of a stack, setting attributes on an object, handling exceptions, and so on. There is nothing about Python the language that specifies bytecode. <clears throat> uh, it's a runtime format used by the CPython interpreter. The CPython interpreter is what provides the virtual machine that can actually interpret and execute that bytecode. But there's nothing to say you can't create an independent implementation of the CPython virtual machine capable of running CPython bytecode. That's what Batavia does. Batavia is a Beware project that is an implementation of the CPython virtual machine written in script. And because it's written in JavaScript, that means it runs in the browser. Now, that might seem somewhat daunting, rewriting a virtual machine. It's actually not that hard. After all, CPython bytecode only has 100 or so basic assembly level instructions, values, most of which are basic mathematical primitives, add value, subtract value, and so on. So re-implementing all of the, uh, the, uh, um, the Python bytecode machine doesn't take that much code. The biggest complication is that CPython makes no guarantees of compatibility because the bytecode specification is not part of the language specification. Between Python 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, there were several major changes in bytecode format and interpretations. You can stay on top of those if you want. It's not a major problem, just kind of an annoyance. If you still don't believe me that this is relatively simple, Ned Batchelder has a project called ByteRun that is a complete Python interpreter written in Python. 1,600 lines of Python. 
a complete implementation of a, of a Python bytecode machine. Alison Kaptur uh, did a great write-up of that code in a book called The Architecture of Open Source. There's a chapter in that book that basically tears apart a Python implementation of a Python virtual machine. If you want to know how Python works at a low level, that is an amazing introduction. I cannot recommend it highly enough. But all these re-implementation efforts are predicated by the idea that you can compile C, C Python for platforms like the web. But what if you could? A few years back, a team at Mozilla looked at the JavaScript language as a whole and worked out the subset of the language that fast. In theory, if you only use that subset of the language, your end code would run really fast as well. And they called this subset ASMJS. Why? Because it's effectively assembly level JavaScript. It's a set of low level primitives for dealing with integers, floating point arithmetic, function definitions, and so on. And so um, people have started building compilers to target those primitives. And Scripton is a, uh, a back end to the, C, uh, to the Clang C compiler. Clang can parse human readable source code in a number of languages, most notably C, and can build an intermediate representation that encompasses the underlying requirements of that code. And Scripton can then take that intermediate representation and output ASMJS. So if you've got a language that Clang can compile, and Scripton can turn that code into ASMJS. Now, ASMJS is not a magical cross-platform fix. ASMJS code is portable and runs fast, but you don't get a transparent bridge between JavaScript and your native code. Integers and floats can be passed back and forth relatively easily. Strings need to be marshaled. There are complications that are in there. You also don't get automatic access to the DOM. Uh, now, this is something you can work around, and the W3C is working on it as well. What you do get, however, is a HTML canvas and OpenGL 3D, 3D graphics APIs. And there are some very cool 3D uh, games demos running in a browser that I can, I'll, I'll show you one of them in a second. But even ASMJS code can be improved upon. What is delivered by ASMJS is still JavaScript code. Admittedly, it's minified, completely illegible code, but it is, a, it is JavaScript code at the end of the day. It still needs to be transmitted in a text format and then parsed and interpreted and executed by your browser. But if we know ahead of time that our code is only going to use the ASMJS subset, can we send our code to the browser in a ready-to-use format? And we can, and that's what WebAssembly is, or WASM. WebAssembly is a binary format that formalizes the ASMJS language subset, or JavaScript subset, in a format that can be delivered to the browser as a pre-compiled, pre-parsed form. This makes it smaller and faster than ASMJS, even though fundamentally it's the same code that's going to be executed. Now, just as with ASMJS, there's no DOM access, so there's all sorts of bridging you need to do, but you do get Canvas and OpenGL libraries. How much do you get? This isn't a theoretical future thing either. If you head to quakejs.com, you will find a full port of Quake, uh, Quake 3 compiled and running in your browser. It takes a minute or two to download because it's you know, a moderately sized uh, bit of code that needs to get downloaded, but once it's there, it's a full 3 uh, full. 3D, first-person shooter, running in your browser. Wasm is supported by all of the major browser platforms today. If your, platform, if your problem is, suits Wasm's current capabilities, you can, and you can set a minimum browser version of you know, nothing more than about two years old, you can use Wasm today. And since Inscripton is a Clang backend, so it means it's a C compiler backend, you can use it to compile C code, which means you can compile C Python to WebAssembly. And that's what Pyodide is. Pyodide is effectively an embedded C Python in your browser. If you, you can, if you use it to hook up some input elements to, on a web page, you can effectively turn that into a Python shell in a browser demo. And if you actually go to the Pyodide website, uh, their demo is effectively a 100% client-side Jupyter notebook, including NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib, running completely in your browser. The downside is that it is big. Uh, the WASM file for Pyodide is about three megabytes. Uh, that's before you've given it any Python code to run or any Python libraries to use. Um, in its current form, Pyodide won't help you write a Django application in Python. Um, but it is Python in the browser using the original C Python source code. Now, it is still very much early days for WASM and Inscripton. There's lots of work still being done in this space, but it is worth keeping an eye on. We are definitely going to hear more about this in the future. And interestingly, the optimization technique of omitting parts of Python that we use to get Batavia can also be used for WASM as well. Pyodide contains a full C Python parser and compiler. But if you were to strip out that C code out of C Python 
and just implement the bytecode machine, just compile the bytecode machine that is written in C, you would end up with a much smaller WASM payload, but you'd still be able to execute C Python bytecode. The downside of this stripped down approach is what you lose as a result. If you strip down the C Python code base, it means you've implicitly made a decision that some parts of C Python are not going to run on your new platform. If you're discarding C Python's parser and compiler, then obviously you can't parse and compile code in your, on your platform. That means your target platform won't be able to compile source code on its own. It means you don't get a REPL, a read eval print loop, the Python prompt that you might be familiar with if you just start a Python on your laptop. Uh, having a REPL depends on the ability to compile code. If you don't have a native code compilation capability, you can't have a REPL. Now that might seem like a big problem, except that the pl pl platforms we're targeting here aren't natural matches for a REPL. We're talking about watches, we're talking web web about web browsers. Nobody wants to be typing Python code into their watch. And if you're building a website, you don't really want to give your end user a prompt to interact with your website while it's running and you know, deploying your Python code. You have to think about the entire uh, development cycle here. Remember, one of the reasons that we're porting Python here is so the same code can run in multiple places, multiple devices. You could develop your code on a desktop machine where you do have access to a REPL and then deploy it to your watch or your phone or your web browser where you don't. And so the core, once you've established that your core logic of your app is working, then you can deploy it to the platform where it's actually going to run and do some final testing. All right, so at this point, either by re-implementing or borrowing from CPython, you've got a parser, a compiler, and an eval loop, so you can run Python code. The only thing that's, but that's only the code. Um, there's still a big piece missing, and that's the standard library. The CPython standard library is made up of two parts. There's a pure Python part and a part written in C. The bit that's written in pure Python is relatively straightforward. We just take that and use it wholesale. It's Python code, so it compiles and runs the same as any Python Python code that's there. We can use it to compile a bytecode, run it through our new virtual machine, or cross-compile it for our new target platform, or just run it on our re-implemented Python, whatever you need to do. But the bits that are written in C, they're a little bit more complicated. There are a couple of reasons why a module might be written in C. There could be performance reasons. There could be just falling back onto a backline implementation. Um, uh, for example, one, a good example of this is like the decimal module was uh, written in pure Python uh, in Python 3.4, but they ported it to C in 3.5 for performance reasons. And that's great for C Python as an implementation of Python. No one complains if Python code runs faster. But if we're looking at C Python as a reference implementation, it ends up being a little bit annoying because it means that you have to implement, re-implement everything that's written in C for your new platform. What we really need here is a reference standard library, much as we've got a reference language, uh, uh, compiler implementation, an implementation of the Python standard library that is written entirely in pure Python, except for a very clearly delineated minimal interface to system services. And that's what Ouroboros is. Uh, for those who don't know the mythology, uh, Ouroboros is the symbol of a snake eating its own tail. Uh, Ouroboros is a Beware project that is very much a work in progress, much like the rest of the Beware tools, but it or something like it is going to be an important part of the whole puzzle if we're going to make it easy to bring Python to as many platforms as possible. The last piece of the puzzle is deployment, which is an area where Python really doesn't have a good story at the moment. Even in the web world, which is considered one of Python's broad strengths, uh, Python's story lags a long way behind some other languages. Um, a Python web developer needs to know about WSGI and web server configuration and Kubernetes and activating virtual environments, which, you know, it's not too daunting once you know how it all works, but it's certainly a long way from one-click deployment and a lot more daunting than a lot of first-time developers are ready for. And hard as it is to believe, the, st the story is even worse on desktop. Now, Python still doesn't have a consistent deployment story for giving code to someone else to run if they're not a Python developer. The good news here is this is a problem that can be solved, and moving to platforms like phones and tablets uh, will force us as a community to address those questions. If you want to distribute apps for your phone, you have to package them as standalone apps with a simple entry point, because that's the only way you can get an app into the App Store platforms, and it makes sense to look at our existing platforms at the same time. And that's what I've been trying to do with a project called Briefcase. Uh, it's a utility that will convert any Python project into a, into, into a deployable unit, an app ready for upload to an app store or as a standalone installer, whatever makes sense for the platform you're targeting. Now again, it's early days for Briefcase. It works well on Windows and Mac OS and iOS, have some preliminary support for Android. If anyone has an interest in Linux, um, looking for a way to contribute to an open source project, I've definitely got some things I'd like you to look at. Um, and that is true of a lot of the tools that I've spoken about here. They are in the early stages of development, but that also means there's a very fertile ground for new contributors. Uh, I'm around for the rest of the conference. If this topic interests you, if you'd like to get involved in an open source project, come have a chat to me. No matter your level of experience, I can find something for you to work on.
Okay, so that is the how. That's how you introduce Python to a new platform. And a couple of approaches that I have used to get Python running on a couple of uh, phones and tablets and in the browser. But why? Why is this important? Why have I spent so much of my time and effort trying to get Python to run in places where it doesn't currently run? For me, it's about evaluating our existential threats as a programming community. Python is on the crest of a wave at the moment. Over the last 28 years, we have built up a community and resources and expertise, and as a result, most surveys will put per Python uh, in the top four or five programming languages that people should know or like to, like to program in, usually only behind Java and C, C++. The growth of PyCon events like PyCon Thailand is one great indicator of that success. So in the midst of this success, it's on us to then look at the future and consider whether the light at the end of the tunnel uh, is the dawning of a bright tomorrow or a train coming straight for us. We need to ask, quo vadimus? Where are we going? Python has been around for 28 years. It was originally found a foothold as a systems integration language on servers. Over time, it found another niche in web servers, resulting in Zope and Plone and Pyramid and Django and Flask and others. The era of Python as a major web platform is you know, 10 years old. Since that time, Python has found a foothold as an education language, as a data analysis language. It's found these footholds because it's an easy and straightforward language to teach while retaining the power of a hardcore computer science language. We have developed a reputation as a community. We have developed that community. We have developed a rich ecosystem of tools and libraries around that core language. But the last 10 years has seen an explosion in the platforms that people are using for computing and the types of people that are using these platforms. These devices have very rapidly become an indispensable part of everyone's lives. They are achieving levels of market penetration that servers and laptops have never seen. And that means that these new platforms are becoming increasingly important parts of the development landscape. If Python doesn't have a good story on mobile, we run the risk of being left behind. Servers aren't going anywhere, but they've only ever been used directly by a minute portion of the world's community. And as for desktop machines, sales trends of desktop machines versus phones and tablets point to a time when desktop machines as we currently think of them either won't exist or they will be niche devices. So if using a general purpose language that can, if I'm using a general purpose language that can only be used on a tiny portion of computing devices, what hope does the language community as a whole have? I would argue not much. My son started high school last year. He doesn't have a laptop for his schoolwork. His entire educational experience is delivered through a tablet device. He wants to be like dad, he wants to learn how to program. Why is he going to learn Python? And how is he going to learn Python? if it doesn't run on the device that he uses all day. But that threat is also an opportunity. Many of the areas where Python has gained traction in science, in education, these are areas where these new devices have the potential to make a huge impact. Imagine a world where a scientist can knock together a quick user interface to put in the hands of experimenters to gather information or provide an app so that citizen scientists can log local flora and fauna or environmental conditions. Imagine a world where you can get kids excited in programming because they can build a game that runs on their phone that they can play against their friends or show to them their parents and their grandparents. Imagine a Django Girl style event where students leave the tutorial not having just built a blog but having built a mobile phone app that can upload photos to that blog. Python is a general purpose programming language. There is no reason it has to be tied to laptops and servers and historical platforms. But we do have to pay attention to the platforms that are emerging. But if we can adapt to this platform change, it is a huge opportunity because there is immense power in being the language that people use to discover computing. Consider the world 20 years ago. Visual Basic was one of the most widespread programming languages in common usage, not because it was an especially powerful or, or, or elegant computing programming, la programming language, um, but because it was present on every Windows computer and it was accessible to non-expert users and enabled people to do powerful things with the Office suite of apps. Visual Basic was their first contact programming language and many users never moved past it. When marketing people talk about selling a product, they often talk about conversion funnels. Okay, conversion funnel is the idea that there is an entire world of people out there that might use your product, but they have to move through your sales process to buy your product. 
At each step in the process, some loss is inevitable, uh, the funnel narrows, but the goal is to minimize that loss between each step and end up with a viable output at the end of the funnel at the end of the day that you can use to generate revenue. It can help to think about adoption of uh, software projects in similar terms. There is an entire universe of people out there that might want to use a programming language or use an open source project. Some of those potential users will become actual users and try out your product for the first time. Some of those people who try the product will continue to use it long term, become uh, long term users of your product. Some of those users will start to help other people and they'll become community members. Some of those community members will start contributing back to the code and start uh, becoming contributors to your project. Some of those contributors will start hanging around and become core members of your team. Some of those core team members will eventually become project leaders. Now, there are two ways to hack a conversion funnel. You can work on the funnel itself and minimize losses as people move down the funnel by writing better tutorials or better guides or having better ideas for how to onboard new contributors. Or you can put more people into the funnel to start with. Ideally, you do both. We have a world of people out there that look at their computers, their phones, their tablets, their watches, their set-top boxes as devices that they use to passively consume content through apps that are developed by some sweaty male boffin in a dark room. We have an opportunity to break that perception, not just to make it easier for experts to develop apps, but to introduce a whole new audience of people to the idea that computing devices can be transformed to do what they want them to do, to meet their needs. There will always be a place for experts, but this new audience isn't looking to do a three-year degree in computer science before they get started. They want to learn one language and have that language be useful wherever they go. But if we're putting more people in at the top of Python's conversion funnel. We're also going to get more people filtering down to the bottom. That means more Python experts. And if we play our cards right, it will be a more diverse audience of experts, not just male boffins in dark rooms. People from a wide range of social, uh, uh, racial backgrounds, economic backgrounds, with rich, diverse experiences to bring to the discussion that shapes the evolution of the world around us. And the result will be a more vibrant Python community overall. But this opportunity won't be around forever. Python has a huge and successful ecosystem of tools and libraries. That ecosystem has taken decades to develop. But Python isn't, if Python isn't available on the languages and the, oh, sorry, on the platforms of tomorrow, that ecosystem is going to stagnate. People are going to seek out languages and ecosystems that are available on these new platforms. I would argue that we are in a race. Either Python will develop support for these new platforms, or the other ecosystems that do have a story on these platforms will develop Python analogous ecosystems. And if that happens, Python becomes less relevant as a platform. The good news is that Python has the advantage here. Getting Python to run on a new platform is a much, much smaller task than reproducing all of PyPI in a new programming language. But that doesn't mean it's inevitable that Python will win this race. Actually doing the work to enable Python to be a viable solution for phones and tablets that's going to take resources. And if we want the work to be done in a timely fashion, that means we are almost certainly going to have to one to get the work done. If you pay people for their time, they are much more likely to be able to maintain their attention on problems until designs are fully fleshed out, consequences are considered, and work gets done. I don't want to undermine uh, uh, the significant contribution that volunteers have given to Python and the Python community, but I do want to challenge the idea that volunteering is the only way that Python or open source can progress. We saw an amazing demonstration of this in the Python community with the rewrite of PyPI. PyPI, the Python package index, has been around for 15 years. It badly needed a rewrite for almost half of that lifespan. Everyone agreed that that rewrite needed to happen, but the work never got finished. Why? Because nobody was being paid to work on it. Then Mozilla gave the PSF a grant of $170,000, and the work was done in six months. Why? Because a couple of people could focus on doing the work, getting the job done, instead of trying to fit in bug fixes on weekends between their kids' football games or trying to convince their boss that although improving PyPI wouldn't make us any money as a company directly, it's a worthwhile contribution to the community. History has shown repeatedly that research and development is how a company or an organization ensures support in the long term. And companies and groups that don't do R&D eventually get eaten by, by organizations that do. I have been doing what I can with, with Beware, but I, I'm really only doing that on weekends. And the same is true of a lot of Python and the Python ecosystem. For the most part, the Python that we have today has been developed in the spare time of volunteers or whatever fragments of time engineers have been able to extract from their employers. What if it didn't have to be that way? 
What if Python had an R&D division, a permanent engineering group that could focus on strategic tasks in the Python ecosystem? When Bell Telephones gave a bunch of engineers the resources to engineer strategically, we got Unix. When you give a, a talented people the resources to think big, amazing things happen. The Python community has talented people. We just need to give them the resources to think big thoughts, to do big things, without the need to demonstrate that the work will generate profits in the next quarter, or without the need to spend half their time on one grant, uh, writing the grant proposal for the next grant. And it could give, uh, open the door to giving high profile paid career opportunities to groups that have been historically underrepresented in open source development, like people in the developing world in Thailand. The underlying problem we have here though is how do we pay for this? Open source is an amazing way to do engineering, but it is not a business model. We need to work out how to fund our engineering goals uh, uh, without uh, compromising the social goals of open source as a movement. But we can't avoid these discussions. Completely aside from the strategic risk that exists to Python as a platform, the way we are addressing our technical issues today is having a very deep impact on some people in our community. I have almost lost count of the number of talented developers around me who have burned out or come very close under the, the, the load that's been imposed by volunteer efforts. I made no secret of the fact that a couple of years ago I went through a major depressive episode, and that episode was in part caused by the pressures of contributing to Django. I'm a lot better now personally, but the underlying community pressures that led me to burnout are still present. This isn't a problem with an easy solution. It isn't as simple as just telling someone, oh, you don't have to volunteer if you don't feel like you can anymore. If you are the maintainer of an even moderately successful project, there's a lot of you tied up in that project. You'd like seeing your project get used. The problem is that your inbox is filled with why haven't you fixed your bug emails, sometimes from people who should know a lot better. And the dissonance between knowing that there is work to be done and knowing that that work is valued by people in the community and literally not having enough hours in the day to do that work and keep that community happy, that's where you get burnout. The good news here is that this is a well-funded industry. The resources exist, we just need to work out how to channel them effectively. If we can start paying for the resources we are consuming as a community, that can directly uh, impact on the incidence of burnout in our community. It means that those doing critical maintenance and R&D work won't be squeezing it in on weekends or in between paying gigs. They will have the resources to do the work that needs to get done. That takes the, taking the pressure off maintainers is a first critical step. But inadvertently, there is a, there's another benefit. It provides a way to address diversity in our industry. Volunteers, by definition, are made up by people who have the time to volunteer. Um, if you've got a family or children or loved ones that need care, those commitments take priority and they limit your ability to volunteer. You want to really address diversity in our community? Make sure you're not just taking from the pool of people who have copious spare time, which broadly speaking means white middle to, uh, middle to upper class Anglo-Saxon men in the West aged 16 to 30. I've spent a lot of time in this talk discussing the technical challenges of getting Python running on new hardware platforms. Those ultimately are the easy part. The technical aspects of computing problems almost always get the most attention, but they are also the easiest problems to solve. They either have an answer or they don't, and if they don't, they have a, a workaround which is in varying degrees elegant or inelegant. You really just need the resources to, to address those, to, to build those solutions. But open source projects are ultimately about communities of people with aligned interests uh, acting collectively. This means issues of communication and collaboration and identity and social justice and inclusivity and funding. These are all intertwined with the technical aspects because without the social aspects, the technical aspects can't be solved. And these challenges don't have simple answers. If you are in this room, I would argue it is almost certainly in your personal interests to consider these problems and contribute to fixing them where you can. The greatest shocks in our society occur when something we assume is plentiful and ubiquitous disappears. Petrol, electricity, clean water. When a city has a petrol shortage or a water contamination scare, society falls apart quickly. The same is true on a much less catastrophic scale with open source software. Witness what happened to the software industry when the Heartbleed bug was discovered in OpenSSL. If your work, commercially, educa in an education context, whatever, depends on an open source project and you aren't contributing to ensure that open source project is well maintained and has a plan for the future and knows what will happen when its biggest contributor to that project has to step down or is unable to continue, then your own project has a clock on it. As a community, we need to institutionalize a minimization of the expectation of free labor. 
If you've got a project role that is going to use resources, be it material, labor, emotional energy, don't assume those resources will be available forever in boundless quantity. Be aware of what you are consuming. If you are a commercial organization who depends on an open source project and you aren't taking steps to contribute to the projects that you use, then I would argue you are being criminally negligent to your investors because you have not secured your supply chain. You haven't mitigated a key risk in your technology stack. So don't just give, or don't just take, give back in tangible ways, either with hard commitments of time or with cash that organizations like the PSF and the DSF can use. And this is especially important if you are a large organization that has extraordinary resources at your disposal and derive immense benefit and profits from the open source and volunteer community uh, uh, projects that you use. But it's not just about finger pointing at bad projects or bad users or bad companies. As an open source community, we have not established the conditions where companies are readily able to mitigate these risks. The free software community has spent lots of time and effort discussing the importance of user freedoms. However, they've been almost silent on the unintended consequences of this position. When software is free as in freedom, it is almost always free as in beer as well, which means the task of making an income off that software is much harder. I don't want to undersell the importance of user freedoms, but to focus on user freedom to the, to the detriment of the physical and mental health of the developers of that software is, in my opinion, incredibly negligent. So what does the future hold for Python? Well, the true answer is I don't know. Uh, I'm outlined what I see as one of the major threats with a related opportunity and the technical options for addressing that threat. But I'm just one voice. But if we want the Python community to continue to be a force in the world of computing, I know we can't stand still. We need to prepare for the future, whatever we perceive that future to be. I'm intending to keep working on Beware, the umbrella project that covers Voc and Batavia and Aroboros and Briefcase and other tools that are needed to get Python code into the hands of end users. If any of those projects get, uh, sound interesting, you'd like to get involved, come and have a chat. The thing is, without funding, it's going to continue to be a hobby project for me. I'd like to see it to be, whole, be a whole lot more. I'd like to see it be a model for a new style of financially viable but socially responsible open source organizations. Um, I'm exploring options for make this happen. If you have any ideas for how I can fund open source projects, please come and have a chat. I promise you I've probably heard a lot of them before, but I'm open to new options and new suggestions if you've got them. All this really, com uh, all this really comes down to an old quote from Pascal. Fortune favors the prepared mind. If you want your project, any project, to be successful or remain successful, you need to plan for that success. It took years for Python to become an overnight success. Django certainly benefited from some early momentum being in the right place at the right time, but real success in the Django project took years. I have benefited from being part of a large and successful project like Django. I'm in the early stages of what I hope will be a similar thing with Beware. But both of these projects wouldn't have been possible, or at least would have been significantly different if it wasn't for the groundwork, groundwork laid out by, the Python and, uh, by, by Python and the Python community. I'm very keen to make sure that groundwork does, doesn't go away. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Francois, the rest of the PyCon Thailand community, for the invitation to speak today. I hope I've given you some thanks for uh, food for thought. Uh, Kanku.